Howdy! So, before we start, there's something I want to show you. See, I recently hired a couple studio assistants and I want you to meet them. Well, you know, hired maybe isn't the right word. They just kind of showed up. Um... Yeah, so my other studio assistant was pregnant, I guess, and I didn't know. I'm gonna put them back, they're a little scared. If you couldn't figure it out, my other studio assistant is also a cat. Don't actually have a studio assistant. Barely have a studio. Okay, so obviously, this video is kind of a long time coming. So we've discussed this idea of a dynamic versus a condenser microphone in a bunch of different videos before this, but this is the first video dedicated to this topic. And much like that video about how to set up a microphone, we're gonna go over this in excruciating detail. Because while some of the concepts might seem simple, and maybe they are a little bit simple, understanding the nuance and the detail behind this is another one of those things. The more you know, the better of an engineer you are. The difference between a dynamic and a condenser microphone is really fundamental in understanding the nature of recording audio because they are, because they're kind of the two main color palettes that we have when we record music. Now, obviously there's other stuff too. There's USB microphones, there's ribbon microphones, there's small diaphragm condensers versus large diaphragm condensers. There's a bunch of microphones that kind of span the, the difference between these two and kind of blur the lines. But today we're just gonna talk about dynamics or condensers because they are kind of uh, the, the meat and potatoes of it all. I've never said that phrase before now, but now that I'm on camera, I have said that phrase. So today we're gonna kind of split it up into three main things. The basics, uh, we're gonna go over common disagreements with things I'm about to say, because I wanna represent ideas that aren't necessarily mine and things that I don't necessarily agree with. I think that's important to be part of the discussion. And then we're going to take apart a dynamic and a condenser so you can get your eyes on all these uh, theoretical concepts I'm talking about. We are also going to be switching between a dynamic and a condenser throughout this whole video so you can hear the audio for yourself. Now, there are sort of three microphones on this channel that are more infamous or famous than others. So since the SM7B and the Rode NT1 are the most popular on the channel, we're gonna switch between those. So yeah, we're gonna try and split the time between the Rode NT1 and the Shure SM7B, almost like this feature on DistroKid called splits. <laughs> so if you watched my video on the RE20 versus the Shure SM7B, you already know I absolutely love DistroKid. I've been using DistroKid long since they decided to sponsor me. If you guys don't know, DistroKid is how you publish your music online. It's an incredibly important tool. It's exactly how you go from somebody just producing music in your bedroom to producing music that the world can see. It's kind of the standard tool to do it. Kind of along those lines, DistroKid gives you all of the earnings you make from streaming music for a flat fee of around 20 bucks a month, depending on the plan you're on. This can get a little bit hairy if you've worked with multiple people on that same project, and there hasn't been a very easy way in order to split up revenue uh, until now. So splits actually lets you split the percentage of revenue that you get from your DistroKid streaming services uh, into an infinite amount. So you can have unlimited collaborators per track. And on top of that, you can add and remove collaborators, set the amount of percentages they get. And a really cool part of this is the musician that you're working with, if they don't happen to use DistroKid, they actually get a discounted price of only $10 for signing up. And also in addition to that, if they're late to sign up, uh, it doesn't affect when your music gets published. They're just gonna hold the money back until they actually sign up, or you can just cancel it if they don't. And again, I mentioned this at the beginning, DistroKid isn't taking a cut of this. They only charge a flat fee of 20 bucks for publishing your music on an endless amount of platforms. I mean, not endless, but a, a crazy amount. Yeah, it's just honestly the best tool for getting your music out there, in my opinion, and, and they make it so easy to collaborate, and they make it so easy to make your music viewable in the public, which is so important especially for a channel like this, because this is all about creating the music and producing the music. Now you gotta get your music out there. Remember, you can get a discount link of 7% if you use my code down in the description down below. Um, if you have any questions on any of this, this isn't just an ad read, you're welcome to message me or leave it in the comments, I will respond. Back to the episode. So let's talk about the basics and the fundamentals of a dynamic microphone, what I'm speaking into right now. The key characteristic of a dynamic microphone is the fact that it's passive. The way it actually produces a signal is through simply a magnet 
with a copper wire wrapped around it, a lot of copper wire wrapped around it. And through the nature of physics and this world, <laughs> that actually makes a very small current. So this works in the same way that you might see a guitar pickup work. If you guys are more familiar with guitar hardware, like I was in the beginning, uh, you can actually just look at a pickup and see how it works. It's just magnets with wire wrapped around it. So this small passive charge that's created from the dynamic microphone is gonna need to be amplified further down the line. Basically what I'm saying is this signal that we've just produced with this magnet and some copper wire wrapped around it is incredibly small. In fact, it's only a few thousandths of a volt in power. This is where we need something like a preamp later down the line to make that a lot louder. Now that signal that we just created, that, that very small thousandth of a volt signal, that's called mic level. So if you've ever heard that term before, all we're describing is the very minute level of charge that we've just produced by speaking into a magnet with a copper wire wrapped around it or the mechanisms involved in a condenser microphone, which we'll get to later. So let's talk about how a condenser microphone works. So first and foremost, they have a more complex capsule that's picking up sound. It's not just a magnet with a wire wrapped around it. It's got moving parts to it. Now it's not a lot of moving parts. It's not overly complex, but it is more complex and therefore a little bit more fragile. So the way a condenser microphone works is it has a back plate and it has a moving diaphragm and some spacers to keep them a little bit farther apart. Now this action of moving the diaphragm based off of the sound pressure that's hitting it uh, back and forth actually makes a small amount of charge, just like with the dynamic microphone. But unlike the dynamic microphone, this isn't passive. We need to power this in order for this to work and in order for it to create a charge. And we do this with the famous 48 volt or phantom power. Look on your audio interface if you have one. If you don't, look at the one you're looking at. It has that option. Now, even though the system is powered, the output is still at microphone level or a few thousandths of a volt, which means we still need a preamp in order to make it louder. We just need less gain than we would on a dynamic microphone. Now, a quick stop before we go to the characteristics behind a condenser versus a dynamic microphone. Uh, there are, as mentioned in the beginning of this video, a number of other different kinds of microphones and a lot of microphones that kind of blur the lines in between a few of these categories. Some of the ones that come to mind, as mentioned in the beginning, are a USB microphone, a small diaphragm condenser, and then also a ribbon mic. Now, a small diaphragm condenser works in a very similar fashion to a large diaphragm condenser, but as the name implies, it has a much smaller radius on that diaphragm in order to pick up sound. Now, this is going to correlate to better room rejection, uh, better handling of higher SPL levels. But I'm going on a tangent already, so let's go ahead and go to condenser versus dynamics characteristics. Now you will also notice whether you're speaking into a dynamic microphone or a condenser microphone, you're, you're probably going to talk differently as I'm doing in this video, which is why I bring this up at all. This isn't part of the script. So dynamic microphones have a few qualities to it that may make you level your voice more. And I'm just kind of riffing here. So I apologize if this doesn't make much sense. Um, first off, it has more sensitivity to dynamics, which means I'm less likely to talk in a more dynamic fashion. I also hear a lot more detail. I hear my mouth noises more than I would on a dynamic microphone. Not to mention I'm hearing the room reflections more, especially coming through closed back headphones. All these things combined are making me regulate the way I talk a little bit more than I would on a dynamic microphone. So that might be seen as a little bit of a trade-off, but the positive to this is it's considered to be a lot more detailed and have a lot more image quality to it, you know, audio image quality. And a lot of that can be contributed to the larger capsule and the more sensitive way of picking up audio. So let's talk about the traits between a dynamic microphone and a condenser microphone. So with dynamics, as mentioned before, it has more capability when it comes to loudness levels, meaning it's going to handle itself better and have less of a chance of breaking when it comes to really high volume stuff. I'm talking a kick drum or a really loud bass amp or a really loud guitar cab. With dynamic microphones, you're going to have a better control of dynamics, meaning you could talk louder and you're going to be less likely to clip. This is why you might find that a dynamic microphone is used more often in rock vocals. Really aggressive vocals actually tend to work out pretty well on a lot of dynamics. And that's in combination with this other characteristic of dynamic microphones, which are typically going to be a little bit less bright. This isn't true of everything. This is definitely a generalization, but I find that condenser microphones have a lot more detail in the high end. Uh, for condenser microphones, you're going to have, as stated before, a little bit more audio detail. You're going to hear more things around you. It's more sensitive. 
as an alternative to dynamic microphones, condenser microphones have more dynamic range, ironically. So if you wanted to pick up a beautiful, detailed vocal, or you wanted a really nice, bright, detailed acoustic guitar image, you might pick a condenser over a dynamic microphone for those reasons. See, what's kind of hard about describing the difference between a dynamic microphone and a condenser microphone is, I think on paper, dynamic microphones tend to come out on top if that makes sense, in the more pragmatic ways that a dynamic microphone might. See, on paper, a dynamic microphone has better room rejection, uh, might not be as likely to clip, less sensitivity to plosives. But there's something less quantitative and maybe a little bit more magical about condenser microphones. Something about the way they pick up audio and something about their sensitivity could provoke more emotion. This sounds a little bit weird, and perhaps not an overly technical way of describing this. But if I were to just jam out on the acoustic guitar and mic it up and monitor it with an SM57 versus a Rode NT1, I'll probably play better when I'm listening back on the condenser. Something about the way it treats audio, something about the way that it makes you feel, it's more expressive in its dynamics. It's more clear and sparkly depending on the microphone. One could argue more organic. That's a bit of a sidetrack. Let's go to disagreements. So I wanna talk about a common disagreement that I've had with people in the comments uh, and, and people online in general. And, and when I say disagreement, almost all of these conversations are very cordial uh, and very well-mannered. This isn't like yelling and screaming like a really toxic environment. I think we should take pride in the fact that our community here is incredibly supportive and very respectful, even though the audio community can get pretty hostile sometimes. The main thing I want to talk about is this idea that condenser microphones and dynamic microphones actually have around the same level of room rejection. The argument goes that in general, if you put a condenser microphone closer to your face, they're going to pick up the exact same amount of SPL levels. The argument also goes that dynamic microphones inherently don't have any quality that make them better at rejecting room noise. Also, anyone who happens to agree with this sentiment, please let me know in the comments. We can have a discussion about it. And this idea that a dynamic microphone doesn't have any quality that inherently makes it better at room rejection, I think is true. I think in the past I might have oversimplified this statement and implied that a dynamic microphone inherently is going to be better at rejecting the room, when in reality it's more about the condenser microphone and its sensitivity to sound pressure levels than it is anything about the dynamic. So large diaphragms specifically, which in general when we're talking about condensers we're probably talking about a large diaphragm, so the mass of that large diaphragm condensers diaphragm inherently makes it more sensitive because there's more surface area for that to pick up sound. So more than just the sensitivity of a larger diaphragm. If you were to put the condenser closer to your face because of this larger diaphragm, a few other things are going to result from this, including increased sensitivity to plosives, increased sensitivity to dynamics, and then of course, extraneous noise. Because of this larger surface area of this diaphragm, you are inherently going to pick up more of a sample size, if you could put it that way. So the answer, therefore, isn't necessarily dependent on a condenser versus dynamic. It's more about the size of the diaphragm itself, which obviously is going to have more of an effect on large diaphragm condensers. Feel free to fight me in the comments, but I will do so with respect and a bow before we begin. Alrighty, well, welcome to the destruction and demise of this SM58. And not gonna lie, I already did it, <laughs> but I didn't hit record, but I put it back together. So we can walk through it and then we're gonna go do the, the condenser mic. You guys probably already know this, but you can just take this off and it's a lot like an SM57, typically. Now, typically, whenever you take off the pop filter from an SM58, you'll see something like this. This is just more protection from plosives. But if I take this off, come on, this is the diaphragm. If we take this off, this is the magnet wrapped around it. And if I just like actually destroy the illusion and show you that I've already cut the wires, there's a bunch of insulation and wiring on inside of here. And then if I take off the housing around the coil, this is the housing that has the magnet in it and then also all of that copper wire wrapped around it. So this is the beating heart. Well, it's not really beating anymore. P previously beating heart of the SM58 and therefore of a dynamic microphone. Uh, you can see there's not a lot of moving parts here. Uh, you're gonna get an input signal hitting the actual magnet itself, 
creating the signal flow, which then goes out here via a bunch of stuff I already ripped off when I thought I was recording. Magnet. Magnet. So let's talk about the condenser now and see what happens when I rip that one apart, because I don't know. Condenser time. This should hopefully be easier if for no other reason than the newer is made out of mostly plastic and the SM58 is built like a tank. This, I'm pretty sure could survive a nuclear holocaust and most other things. This little housing. All right, let's start by unscrewing the bottom. Okay, that was easy. Okay, then there's two screws here. Tiny screws. Dude, you have no idea. I'm, it's a shame I didn't get it recorded because the SM58 was like a solid 15 to 20 minutes of me trying to rip that thing apart. And I'm literally doing it with three screws on the newer. <laughs> okay, so the big reveal of the capsule on the condenser microphone. Well, usually they look nicer than this, but of course this is a $20 uh, condenser microphone. So you can actually see the diaphragm on this is relatively small but it's gonna hit here, and if we actually get super close, see if we can actually focus. Yeah, check this out. So you can actually see the grill um, that's helping, I think probably with plosives. So this is the piece that actually moves, makes the capacitance that can then change into a signal, and then we go into the active circuitry, because we need power in order to get this off the, uh, get this off the table, and then it's sent further down the line. So use your imagination a bit with this uh, housing for the dynamic microphone, but you can imagine there's a bunch of copper wrapped around this. That's what's producing the signal. And I hope, and then I hope over video you can see that this thing's indestructible. And this, even though it's a relatively cheap example, and by relatively I mean extremely, it's pretty fragile. This is a small moving part that's in charge of creating basically the entirety of the audio signal, uh, which is then amplified later on. There wasn't really a, a super big point to this section. I just wanted to show you with your own eyes what's inside of a dynamic and what's inside of a condenser, what makes them both work, and why the condenser is a lot more robust. I mean, whenever we go into the housing here, it's just wires. Just wires that are being amplified down the line. This actually has a circuit board, even though it's a relatively simple one. Ooh. Was that a dumb idea? Back to the couch. All right, guys, I hope that was helpful. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you so much for listening to all the cars outside my apartment. Good timing. If you have any questions about dynamics or condensers, please leave them down in the comments down below. You can also message me on Instagram at Real Audio Haze. If you'd like to work with me on a project, whether that's voiceover or mixing, you can email me at realaudiohaze at gmail.com. And with that, I hope this was helpful. I hope banging on that newer with a hammer was productive and i'll see you in the next video goodbye